that turkey. And you say it like that, you, uh, now, and this is one word, but it has totally different meanings unrelated to each other. Oh, there is a fourth one, I just remembered. The fourth one is, I'm pointing to somebody and I say, how do you like that turkey? Only watch, how do you like that turkey? Because that's his name. How do you like that turkey? Because that is a name that a lot of people have in Saudi Arabia. Why? Well, at one time, at one time, a lot of people from Turkey, from the Ottoman Empire, did some very amazing and influential things there, and they had left their legacy there, and their children's children's children are there, and they still like to use the name. Some of my best friends in Saudi Arabia are named Turkey. But if you bring your child to this country and you put him in the American public school and you say, okay, my child is named Turkey, they say, no, 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 no. And this really happened, a friend of mine, he told me one time, he said, I want to put my child, he said, it's the best day of my life. I remember what he said. He's from uh, Jeddah. He said, the best day of my life. I said, why? He said, because today I enrolled my son in American public school. And he's looking at me like I'm supposed to get excited. I said, why didn't you put him in the toilet? And he said, oh, no, you don't understand. No, no, I said, I put my, my child, my boy, in American public school. I said, uh, you said it in English. I understand English, but if you want me to say it uh, in Arabic, hamam, why didn't you put him in the toilet? And he just looked at me like that. I said, yeah, because you can wash it off. What you do in your public schools you can't get rid of it. And he's like, what? Yeah. So he walked off. He didn't, like, this crazy guy. I thought he was, you know, somebody. <laughs> he didn't understand. Then he, the next week, I saw him again, and he was frustrated. <laughs> and I said, what's the matter? What happened? He said, oh. You know, I put my boy in American public school. I said, no, we went, we went through that routine last week, but yeah, okay. He said, yeah, they won't let my son use his name. I said, really? They want us to change his name. And I'm thinking it's probably Mohammed, something like this, and they don't want to go. And I said, what's his name? He said, Turkey. I understand the problem, but I said, it's a beautiful name. What's their problem? They said they want to call him George. George? <laughs> said, uh, what's the problem? I, I give him another name. They said, no, the teacher said he has to be George. I said, no, no, no. You have rights, all right? And definitely that's your right to be called what you want to be called. So what other names does he have? And he, in his name, he has Omar. I said, let him call him Omar. And that's a good name everywhere on the planet. By the way, this, the Spanish in Mexico have adopted this name as one of their own official names. They don't realize that, the, that Muslims ruled Spain 700 years before the Catholics came in and tortured them to death. They don't, they don't know that. They just know that Omar is a, a traditional name that they got from their grandfathers and so on. They don't know. Anyway, some other names that they have in Mexico, when we visit down there and share the message, it's interesting because so many of the words that they have, they think are Spanish, but they're not origin Spanish. You know what they are? Arabic. Huh? What is chamis? Anybody know what's chamis? Huh? Not this one, this one, here we go. The shirt, chamis. In Spanish, chamisa. What is, what's this, uh, yeah, what, what's this called in Arabic? Huh? What, what is it in, in Spanish? I mean, in, in uh, Arabic? Bantalon, Bantalon, yeah. The Spanish changed one thing, they changed the letter. 
to a P, pantalones, pantalones. And our word pants is a form of that. <gasps> You'd be surprised how many words are. And what I'm telling you is that when you use words, you find a lot less offense to this subject than you do if you come in and say, you know what, I don't like those turkeys, or I don't like this guy, or I, my, I'm for this and you're for that, and you're drawing a line and putting out somebody on the other side and you're on this side, and debates do the same thing. You have a lot of, a lot of people feel like a debate is a good thing because look what we gain, meaning we want to win over the opponent, like a ping pong game or something like that. The problem, the way we use debates today, is not to really gain knowledge. We want to put somebody down and we want to beat them. If that's the case, this defeats the purpose of what's called manadra in the Philagot Arabia. In the Arabic language, when you say manadra, you're talking about an intellectual discussion with two opposing views that they can be discussed back and forth until you find maybe even a resolution between the two, or at least you part company holding your view but understanding somebody else's point of view much better. That's what manadra is, but what we turn, we, we translate that as debate, and then we go out here and almost put on fisticuffs, you know, how we wanna get uh, physical almost with these people over different opinions. So when you do something like that, you are drawing a line and putting somebody on this side and you're on that side. You know what's wrong with that? When you're trying to deliver a message, especially of the magnitude of what we have, why would you want to take a chance to alienate somebody even before they know what the message is? Why? Because in reality, we should draw a line, yes, and we should be on one side and somebody else on the other side. But you know who the somebody else is? Not human beings, the devil himself. Because this is the one single biggest enemy, according to the Quran, the biggest enemy to mankind. Do you know that? How many of you know where I'm talking about in the Quran? Anybody? You know where it is? In Surah Baqarah. Ya ayyuladina amanu udkhulu fi sumi khabatan. O you who believe, enter into the way of al-Islam perfectly. And do not follow the, what the what, of the shaitan. Verily, he is an avowed enemy to you. Who is the biggest enemy to us? The devil. So if you said, oh, you know what? The Jews are the biggest enemy to the Arabs. Big deal. They're both humans on both sides. Who is making them really fight each other, kill each other, whatever they're doing? Huh? The shaitan, the devil. Is it right or wrong? Because either way, he wins. When you're killing innocent people, you're going to hell for it. Yes or no? Is that what Islam teaches? Is that what Christianity teaches? Is that what Judaism teaches? So all three of these great religions have that same understanding, and yet the people are doing that. Therefore, who wins? The devil. And that's exactly what we're supposed to be avoiding. So whenever people invite me to go to debates, I tell them I'm happy to come for a dialogue because I can learn and we can share. But I'm not in a hurry to get into something that could bring about animosity. Also, when we talk about this topic, there, there's, an, there's one more thing. And I heard it, I, I think I can sum it up by how, what I heard from a Baptist minister and the very first so-called dialogue debate that I attended after becoming a Muslim. And just a few months after I entered Islam, Dr. Jamal Bedoui came all the way to Texas and uh, Shimon, or no, that wasn't his name, something similar to that. 
uh, he came down to, uh, to dialogue with him. But I read his paper that he was sending out to his Christian followers, and he said some very derogatory things about Muslims, and he also said, yeah, I need a lot of money to fight against these guys. And by the way, the Muslims paid for his ticket to come over. I don't know what his money was talking about, but he used it as an opportunity to do fundraising. Anyway, what's the problem? You're watching Guide Us TV coming to you live all the way from right here in the Dianet Center in Baltimore, Maryland. And we're having a very merry time in merry land right now. We have a live studio audience with us. I'm going to give them the greetings the greetings from Islam, and we'll listen to them respond back. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Uh-huh. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. All the praise be to God Almighty, and I thank Him. And all of us, we say, Nashkur Allah. We thank Allah. Thank Almighty God for all the blessings he bestows on us. And this is the month, the month of fasting, Shah Ramadan, the month of Ramadan. And this is a great time for us to all gather and be together and share together. And we have, I think we have uh, some Muslims here. Any Muslims here? Whoa, okay. How about non-Muslims? We have any non-Muslims with us? Ah, oh, mashallah. How do you like being surrounded by all these terrorists? Uh, 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 sorry, sorry. That slipped. Bomb making is Wednesday night. I forgot about that. All right. Was that out loud? You know I'm from Texas, right? Yeah. But I didn't vote for him, by the way. That was out loud too, wasn't it? Okay. Anyway, we're having a lot of fun, and we're enjoying each other's company. I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce our topic before we go any further. What we're going to do is the etymology of a particular word. Now, this is, word is interesting to me in a lot of ways, not the least of which that it's strange that it's not translated, because it's not an, it's not an English word. Uh, and speaking of translations, let me first say this and be, be clear about it, that I am not a native English speaker. I do have to translate in my mind from my native language. I grew up in Texas, so I'm translating from Texas language to real English. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, Narba? Yeah. So... And by the way, I should have introduced myself. I introduced the program, the television channel, everything, and I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Yusuf. Yusuf. Can you say Yusuf? Yeah. Wow, you guys got it right on the first time. Why is it my wife, even all these years, she still pronounces it useless? <laughs> Could be a speech in peppermint, right? Yeah. Well, I promised myself I wasn't going to talk about any food items in the program tonight, because we're fasting, right? So forget about the peppermint, OK? I think somewhere I have one in my pocket, too. Yeah. There we go. I keep up with these little candies. You never know when it could have an emergency. Now. It's very informal, by the way. We don't have a cameraman on this. Uh, so, uh, yeah. But 
we're, we were glad to see you're back. Alhamdulillah. By the way, if you laugh at these jokes, it's really better for you. Because if you don't laugh, they progressively get worse. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I wanted to talk about this word, a particular word, that is not an English word, but a lot of people assume it is. The word is Islam. How many of you knew that was not an English word? Anybody knew that? It's not an English word. But it's treated like an English word. Do you know how? Have you ever read a translation of the Quran? Anybody ever seen a translation of the Quran? Yeah? Wow. All right. A lot of you have seen translation of the Quran. To the English, right? Yeah? No matter which word it is, you can find some fault with it. You could. Because translations always fall a little short of the mark. There's a few words that are exactly the same. House and bait. Unfortunately, bait sounds like a word in English that we use to catch fish with. You know, but that's okay. Bait, house. It means pretty much the same thing. But there are a lot of words that we don't have in English. English is very limited when it comes to being able to really express yourself. Now, some people who are poets, and they use a lot of English, they would try to argue with me that point. But I will share with you that there are over 5,500 roots in the Arabic language. And from these, there's an untold number of words that come from each of these roots. And you can say so many things with just a few words in Arabic that you have to use sometimes sentences, paragraphs, maybe even a full page to get the full meaning out of it. All right? So when you take a translation of the Quran and you open it up, you turn to chapter 3, verse 19. In the Arabic, it says, in the dina, in the lahi, Islam. So we heard the word at the end of that, the word Islam. The translation says, verily, in verily, the only deen, translated as religion, with Allah, translated as God, is Islam, not translated. This is ayah number, or verse number 85, translated as, and whoever wants a deen, translated as religion, other than Islam, not translated, that will never be accepted by Almighty God, and in the hereafter they'll be amongst the losers, meaning in the hellfire. But why is this word Islam not translated? Because it is an Arabic word, and if you're a translator, why are you not translated? There's, a, there's other words. Sometimes some translations will not translate Allah to be God because they will say, well, that's his name. And in Arabic, Elah means God. Exact G-O-D is Elah. So I give them that. But keep in mind who you're translating for, and they don't understand that Almighty God, G-O-D, with a big G, has a real name that he calls himself by. And even in the, in the Christian Bible in English, you find his name in there, but they're not going to be ready to accept that because they haven't been acclimated to that yet, all right? And for, we do, a, are you a Christian? Sort of, kind of. All right, okay. So you probably be familiar with the New Testament. And the one who's on the cross, I'm phrasing this a certain way. The one who's on the cross, we don't deny that there was a cross, by the way. We're just denying that Jesus was the one on it. You know that, right? Okay. 
So the one on the cross, though, according to the Bible, in two different uh, Gospels, is saying, Elahi, Elahi, Lima Sabachthani. What does that mean in Arabic? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, in the Bible, it translates it after it gives you those words, and it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So we know that this must be at least a good translation of it because that's even today we understood this. All right? The question is, do you realize Elaki in one of the, trans the uh, Gospels as opposed to the other one, Eli, Eli, sabach, uh, Lima Sabachthani, because these are two different words, one representing Elah and the other one representing Allah. One is the name and one is the position that he holds. All right, so all of this is a setup, by the way, to come back to the word Islam. Why isn't it translated? At least we could do like the translators of the Bible and put it in brackets or something. But they didn't. And so the, the, and these two examples are not the only place. Let me give you another one. These are all critical places in the Quran. And there's another one. It's in Surah Mayada, chapter 5, verse 3, in the middle of the, the ayah, Allah Bala Min Shaitan Razim. We always say this before you quote from the Quran because you're seeking refuge with God from the evil of the devil. So we say, Awlu Billahi Min Shaitan Razim. Now that's the Arabic. The translation says, on this day, Al Yom is a day, same in Hebrew, Yom, Yom Al Kippur, Yom Kippur, Yom Al Akhir, so on. So on this day have I, Almighty, perfected for you your way of life and conferred upon you my greatest nama, favor, translated, not bad, and chosen for you as your way of life, Islam, not translated. So when a non-Muslim reads this, even Muslims, they read it, they think that this, this means religion. That's the name of a religion. What's that religion? Okay, well, let's see what the news says about that religion, and we'll know what that is. Now, in the Quran, it also tells us that Abraham, we have to say peace be upon him for all of the prophets. Abraham, alayhi he was a Muslim. Whoa! Oh my God, you opened up some doors here. Amazing. And by the way, Muslim is not translated. Is Muslim an Arabic word or English? Translator slipped up again. And why? Because the first translator of the Quran to English wasn't a Muslim. George Sale, a Christian who was very familiar with the Arabic and the English, translated the very first one. And he did an excellent job, a very excellent job, although he's not convinced about Islam enough to accept it, at least not publicly. You know there's a lot of closet Muslims, right? In the priesthood especially. I've met them. But what I'm seeing for our benefit and for those who are watching this at home, this word Islam should be at least discussed or put a paragraph underneath it or somewhere to let people know what you meant by what you said. Because very much they've got the wrong attitude, I think. But let's discover for ourselves right now. Let's break down this word. Let's take a look at this thing from the Arabic meaning. Okay, we can do that. The word Islam comes from, it's a noun, by the way, it is a noun. 
I used to think it was a verb. The verb for it is aslama. Aslama is the verb. This comes from a root in Arabic, sin, lam, mim. Now, what sprouts from this root? You will be, I hope, amazed and pleased to learn some of the things that come from it. The first and foremost, though, I'm going to ask the audience here to help me with a demonstration. Also, that kind of wake you up if you're bored. Ready? Okay. Put your hands up. Get them up, neighbor. I got my gun. No, anyway, you get that? Now, I want you to take your hands up higher and touch your fingertips. Now you're ready for airport security. <laughs> you can put your hands down now. Well, that was fun, right? The word, the first word, and I use airport security for a reason, is submit or surrender. Surrender. You give up. If you want to go through airport security, if you want to get an airplane, you got to go through their deal. Is that true? Yeah. And if they say, put your hands like this, you better not go like, eh, that's close enough. Nah, nah, get out of here. Go home. You will totally surrender what they tell you to do. Also, if they ask you, give us your purse. Open it up. You can't say, well, no, this is private. I don't, I don't like you getting my purse. Oh, really? Get out of here. Oh, wait a minute. You passed that line? That means, actually, you can't get out of here now. You have to go over to this room and wait for the FBI to come and investigate you. Oh, whoa. <laughs> what did I get into? This first word, surrender. The second word, actually, I'm going to make a distinction here, is submit in the sense that you're going to cooperate, you've surrendered, and now you're gonna cooperate and submit to whatever they're telling you to do. The third word is obedience, and these are all connected, you can see that. But the obedience here, and the submission here, and the surrender here, are all based on the next word, which is sincerity. Because in airport security, you don't have to be sincere at all. You should give the appearance that you're being sincere, but you don't have to be sincere. No. You, oh, I'm really enjoying myself. Thank you so much. Yes. Oh, oh and you want to pat me down. Okay. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's fun. Thank you so much. Actually, I kind of like when they do the feet. That feels good. Anyhow, the point that I'm trying to make, though, in the word Islam, there is a condition here that's a part of the word itself, which is Sincerity. Now, I'm going to ask the audience, and I'll listen for your response, but is it acceptable in Islam to be 99.9% .9 sincere in what we're doing as, as far as our relationship with God? Is it 99.9? .9? Okay, what about 99.9999999? No. It has to be 100% or nothing, right? That's what I was told, too. And it's right. 100% sincere. Now, now, wait a minute. Hold on. I heard that Islam spread by the sword. How do you spread sincerity with a sword? Now we come to my purpose for this discussion. Because those who have been told that Islam spread by force, by swords, by grenades, by bombs, human beings blowing themselves up or whatever, if that's how Islam spread, huh? There's a couple more words, but I'm gonna play with this just for a second because I wanna get the full scope of this. You're saying Islamic terrorism, I heard that so many times in the journals, the newspapers, on the air, people on those foxy networks, <clears throat> You see, and I'm saying, right? <laughs> yeah, you get it. But if you can catch these little jokes that I'm throwing around, how come you can't get the fact that these are oxymorons? This is the opposite. How do you have somebody that's a sincere, dedicated, surrendering to God, 
obeying God's orders and commandments in full submission to God. Terrorist! But wait, there's a couple more words. Whenever you see Arabs, now this is any Arab, it could be any Arab, it doesn't have to be an Arab Muslim. Many, many Christian Arabs are out there, atheist Arabs, and also Jewish Arabs. I don't know how they'll get along in Palestine, but that's their problem. I'm just saying there are Arabs, Arab descent, speaking the Arabic language, who are not Muslim. But when they leave each other, a, a, not a greeting, but a farewell kind of a thing, eh, and you give a, a little wave and you say to them, Ma, Ma Salama. It doesn't mean peace. It sounds like salam, right? It's related. It's very closely related to this word, aslama. Aslama, masalama, Islam, all of these are very closely related. It means go in the safety of assalam, and that's bringing us now to the next word in English, peace. Now, sometimes when you ask a Muslim, what is Islam? They'll say, Islam is peace, you know? But actually, I ask them, you know, put down one finger, okay? Because God is only one, all right? And he is a salam. That's one of his attributes, his characteristic. It's called asma wa safa in the Arabic language. The characteristics that we know, 99 characteristics of Almighty God. He calls himself by those names in the Quran and in the Hadith. And he is Ahad and Wahid. Wahid is one. Everybody who is in the monotheistic faith say God is one. But only Islam said Ahad. Wahid, yes, one. But Ahad, Ahad is uniquely one. Meaning that there cannot be a two that comes after it. It's just all by itself. It's uniquely one. And that's the kind of one that we know Allah is. Um, amazing to know this. A lot of Christians I talk to, they agree with that right away. Say, yes, I, yeah, that's what I've been trying to say. Mm -hmm. And by the way, in the Quran, Allah said, min humu mu'minun, talking about the people of the book, Ahl Kitab. And he's saying that from the Christians, and Jews, there are true believers. And most of them are disobedient, corruptors, but some are real believers. So this is in the Quran, I, uh, 110 in chapter 3, Surah Al Imran. They're telling us we got to wrap it all up, so I want to come to the next words real quick. We said safety, security. All of this is there, going to safety and the security. Security is there. And we just talked about airport security. What are we talking about security? You cannot be a Muslim unless you're seeking after this security from God. And when you are a Muslim, you are in that security regardless of what's going on around you because this is an emotional thing, a thing that you're feeling, a thing that you're believing, a thing that you're doing, and it's an all-encompassing word, and probably that's why the translators don't translate it. It's easier to just say Islam and we'll go to the next sentence to translate. Because everything that I just said still does not encompass all of it. But certainly, that's a good start. And I'm encouraging you to keep watching this channel right here because this is how we're... Did you know that the more you just do that, I already saw you. Peripheral vision. Got it? So, anyway, so you stay tuned right here to this channel and get guided with Guide Us TV. Okay, but for those that are sitting in the room, you would like to get a finish up on this real quick and then we'll excuse you. And that is that anybody who wants to delve into this subject of Islam, they should know that in the Arabic language, we don't put ER after the verbs to demonstrate what the action is or who's performing the action. 
For instance, a performer is somebody who performs, right? A talker is somebody who talks. A thinker is somebody who thinks. A stinker, well, you know what that guy is. So you get the idea of what I'm talking about. In Arabic, instead of a suffix, er, we have a prefix, mu. So the adhan in the Arabic language is what is called the prayer. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. All right, so that is the adhan, or a Texas version of it. And anyway, so then the one who is calling it is not an adhaner, he's a mu'adhan. When you travel, you're a traveler. In Arabic, safar is travel, S-A-F-R, safar. And somebody who does it is a mu'safar. And by the way, the word safari comes from Arabic. Hmm. You know, there are a lot of words that help us get closer together with a lot of people. And this is my point from all that I've been saying. I want to be able to deliver a message. You deliver a message, you have to have, like if you're pouring water, you have to have a receptacle that'll receive it. Otherwise, you're pouring it on your boots or shoes, right? Is that right? You have to have something to put it in. Now, the human being that you're talking to is like a glass. If the glass is already full, you can't add anything to it. And if you alienate that person, you're basically turning them upside down. Now, whatever they had that was good in there, that's gone. Plus, now you won't get anything in there at all. So the idea is to get people calmed down, release some of that negative energy, or let them understand where you're coming from, and hopefully that little glass that they've got, that receptacle, that brain, that heart, will have a place for this new information to come. If that's the case, I've watched in so many cases, not just tens, not just hundreds, not just thousands, I've seen tens of thousands of people accept this concept, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There is really only one God to worship, and he is the God of Adam, Abraham, Moses, David, Suleiman, Jesus Christ, and Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon them all, and they all said the same thing. That's the only God. Worship him, not what he created. If you can see it, touch it, smell it, feel it. Imagine it, it ain't God. It's something he created. The Bible tells us that God is not a man and he's not the son of man. The Bible in the New Testament, that's in the Old Testament, the book of Numbers, chapter 23, verse 19. In the New Testament, we have something even more pronounced coming back to this. I got gotcha. you. To wrap it up, I'll give you this last one. And it's saying in the New Testament, they asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And look at his response. Usually the minister who tells you this from the pulpit only gives you half the story because it's a dead giveaway if you hear the whole thing. They'll just tell you to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul in a commandment like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, wrap it all up and go out of the church. That's only half the verse. It starts out by saying, the greatest commandment is to know, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, and him you have to love with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength and all your soul, and a commandment like unto it to love your neighbor as yourself. Because it's an exact quote, even the neighbor, love your, love your neighbor, is a quote out of the Old Testament, the books of Moses in Leviticus, and with that, we'll wrap it all up. I ask Allah to guide us, guide you, guide all of us to the straight path to Jannah for Dosa Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.